We are with Miss Cosmo yes. herself. Yes. How are you doing? I'm good on yourself. Ah, no, no complaints, uh -huh. no complaints. I'm glad you could join us. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm really looking forward to hear another side of you that people don't know. Okay. We know, which is the financial side, because yes. people don't talk about that. <laughs> yeah, I don't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, you were born in Deep Kloof, but then you, you relocated to the northern suburbs. Yes. And let's talk to us about Jay, your upbringing, your family background, and so on. I lived in Deep Kloof until I was about five, six years old. Mm -hmm. And we moved uh, through to the northern suburbs around that time. I mean, we can thank Mandela for that yeah. because <laughs> we were finally yeah. free. <laughs> yeah, you owned to, time. <laughs> to go and join the good side of life. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? <laughs> so that's when I, we actually moved in through oh. to, um, to Signing Hill. We stayed okay. there for a couple of years. But I did go to school in oh. the northern suburbs as well. Mm. I went to Branston Primary. I went oh. to Branston High School. Oh. Um, yeah, and I went to study at UJ. Yeah. Mm. Look, there aren't so many families who would move from Kukasi, yeah. and then boom, uh, you know, in the northern suburb, yes. boom. Ah, you know, can you imagine, Pedro, when we're talking Bryanston Primary, Bryanston High School, I mean, for you it might be, ah, you know, but for some of us it's yeah, a big deal. It is. You know, but surely that must tell us something where it, you know, it, 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 it was a good sign that your parents got it together. Yes. Um, what were some of your observations in terms of how they handled money mm. and just generally their outlook when, as, as far as their financial management? I think my parents were definitely um, a lot more privileged in, this, in the sense that they had education on their side. I think education definitely was a backing in how they, they, they carried themselves and how they actually brought us up as well. Sure. They both went to Forte mm -hmm. University, that's actually where they met. And both of my grandparents on both maternal and uh, paternal side were educators. Mm. So obviously education, very important part of their upbringing. And obviously when they went to university, they made sure that they equipped themselves with um, the right type of, of degrees to actually get them into certain spaces. Mm -hmm. My dad, for instance, just like me, also a financier, he studied um, finance as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I think also his background in becoming a banker influenced the way that he managed money and influenced the way that he understood what was important for us as a family and mm -hmm. how to actually then raise us in mm -hmm. South Africa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Surely you must have made some, some very specific observations around mm -hmm. the etiquette and their posture towards money, Jay. Mm. I mean, what, are, what were those lessons you learned from them? The biggest lesson that I did um, get from both my parents is needing to work for what you want. Mm. That was a big lesson that I had received, especially from my dad. Everything had kind of like a cause and effect. You work for something, you get a reward. Mm. And I think from then on, that's how I kind of grew up and I figured out that that's how I needed to then maneuver my way through, through life. Mm. Um, and it was very important at that point in time for me to understand that because I also then understood that not everything comes for free because you know children can just scream and expect everything to fall from a tree and that's not how life works you know what i mean so yeah. i think that was important yes coming from a family with an, a very strong yeah. academic background that's certainly influenced uh some of your choices in terms of i mean you have a whole Bcom degree yes. in, um, in, finance. in finance and yeah. investment management i mean that's big yes it is uh but at what point did you make that bold decision? I'm going to switch in, uh, to entertainment. Mm. Finance, I see, but perhaps mm. maybe there's, there's, a, there's a space for it. Mm. But my career is in entertainment. Look, I think as humans, we all have certain um, passions. Mm. And we also have certain directions that, that are going to take us into different spaces. Mm. I mean, my stand, studying finance, obviously a little bit influenced by my dad mm. because he was also a banker. Um, but it was also just what I was just good at. Like, yeah. I'm, 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 maths is my thing, yeah. numbers are my thing, accounting is my thing. So mm. it was just easier for me to kind of go in that direction, mm. you know. And I did. I mean, I went the, 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 the full way. I studied and I also then started working at a bank. Um, and I worked there for about four years. I was a... a property consultant actually. I was yeah. assisting people with actually getting um, you know, applications through to credits and purchasing commercial properties. Yeah. And at that time, I mean, I started out as a graduate consultant. Yeah. So 
I didn't really have money. I didn't really know what I wanted. But going back to the conversation around passion, music has always been there from when I was a kid. Yeah. Always performing for my parents, performing yeah. for their friends, you know, that <laughs> being that little star in the yeah. house. Yeah. But when you grow up and you get into high school, you go to university, you start thinking back and you're like, hey, but is this the thing that I really want to do? Yeah. What do I want to do? I wasn't yeah. sure at the time. But something that I was subliminally doing that I didn't realize at the time hmm. was I um, I developed this thing where I was doing uh, I was making mixtapes when I was in high school. Yeah. So I would create like these mixtapes because I had like lists of songs that I wanted hmm. to make, hmm. and I would send them to my friend. He would burn a couple of CDs for me, um, but don't do that. That's piracy. Hmm. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah. um, I used to create these mixtapes and yeah. going into varsity, a lot of my friends used to ask me to bring those CDs with me yeah. whenever we'd have bras or parties or whatever. So subliminally, I was already a DJ, but I didn't really know that's what I was doing. Yeah. Got to a point where a friend of mine suggested, hey, why don't you get into DJing? You've actually got an ear for this thing. But I didn't have the money to actually then immerse myself into it because it's a very expensive hobby to have. Yeah. Equipment's ex expensive, the lessons are expensive. So I was like, you know what, mm. let me just continue with finance. This seems like a safer route for me. Yeah. And as I started at my job, that's when I started earning a salary. And I was like, okay, well, here's my chance. Yeah. And I went for DJ mm. classes. So I went to a DJ school, learned how to actually start it out. And when I started, I was still just kind of like, you know, doing the double time thing. A lot yeah. of my friends would ask me, they're like, ah, you're a DJ, but you're doing a nine to five. And I was yeah. literally working, going to the office, mm. Monday to Friday, on the weekend, yeah. Friday to, I was doing the gigs. Mm. It got to a point where it got really taxing. Yeah. And it also got to a point where I was doing too much of both, mm. where I wasn't really giving 100% of my energy to yeah. either of my jobs. Mm. I was struggling on the nine to five side because I was exhausted. I was thinking about too many things that I wanted to do. And nah, I need to do interviews during the yeah. week, but I have to be at the office. It was mm. getting a little tricky. Mm. On the weekend, I'm exhausted because I'm sleeping late. So I think I had to then sit back and say, okay, if I take this risk, mm. would I be able to financially look mm. after myself yeah. before I decide to take this jump. Mm. So I definitely had that pros and cons conversation with myself and yeah. say, okay, what am I gonna do? What am I not gonna do before I take the leap? Mm. And I was lucky enough to actually manage my finances. I actually paid off my car wow. before I even left. Mm. Um, so that when I did leave, then the only thing I was really just looking after was maybe just insurance and paying for rent, yeah. which really wasn't much at the time. So yeah. I think um, taking that risk was one of the best decisions I've made for myself. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't take it back. But I do still appreciate mm. what I did when I was working in the finance space because I think a lot of the teachings is what I implement in myself mm. as an artist today. Yeah. yeah. So when you finally made that bold decision mm. to jump, how did your family react to that? Yo, <laughs> black people. <laughs> mm. um, look, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think at the time, I had gotten pretty independent because I had been at the bank for about close to like three and a half, four years. Um, so I was really just making a lot of my own decisions. Even when I started the DJing, because remember I was DJing while I was working. Yeah. But then when I was like, hey, ma, this, uh. this is looking like a serious thing. Yeah. And she was just like, I, then I'm okay, like yeah. do what you need to do. She was obviously a little bit worried, yeah. but I think she could see that I was, I, I was very determined in what I was doing because I was also yeah. achieving a lot of things very early in my career. Yeah. My dad was just like, don't phone me for money. <laughs> <laughs> don't call me when you have problems. It, it, it sounds more like me. So I'm you not know the what? guy. This is your call, man. Yeah? Yeah. Do what you want with your life. Yeah. I've done my job. You've yeah. been to school. Mm. That's it. Um, but I think they're both very, very proud of, of, of mm. how I've managed to maintain myself even after taking that risk. Yeah. So how did the name Miss Cosmo come about? So it comes from the cocktail Cosmopolitan. All right. So at the time, because I was at the bank, I mm. didn't really want to be DJ Noni because it felt very boring, but it yeah. was also just like I wanted to have like two different personas yeah. um, to be Noni at the bank. Mm. DJ on the weekend, <laughs> yeah. you know. Mm. Um, so trying to figure out a name, I was I went out for drinks with a couple of friends of mine. Um, actually, um, DJ Dimples, um, mm. may rest in peace. He's the one who gave me the name. Okay. A very good friend of mine. He was also very motivational in me getting into the DJ space because yeah. he's a big supporter of females in the space as well. Mm. Mm. Um, and he's the one who actually gave me the name because I had one too many Cosmopolitans and. Mm. You know, we're here. Yeah. And then he, he gave me the name DJ Cosmo. Yeah. And then I added the miss in the front mm -hmm. just to reiterate that I'm a female. Talk to us about some of the biggest names that you've worked with and your love for hip hop. 
I think what also helped at the time yeah. as well was that I was on radio. Uh. So I think that platform definitely elevated uh. my brand a lot more. Yeah. It gave me access to certain artists yes. um, from an interview perspective. Uh. And I think my biggest um, love and 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 contribution uh. to the music industry was also giving them a platform because I think at the time hip-hop wasn't really getting a lot of um, interviews and wasn't getting a lot of spaces to kind of express themselves. So I gave myself that, that opportunity to say, here's a hip-hop show. Whoever's up and coming, they're going to come on the show. They're going to be able to kind of, yeah. you know, come speak and, and present themselves. And that's how I culted a lot of my relationships. Yeah. My first single had Nasty C, Cuesta yeah. and Rouge, which was really dope. And, and, and I think I appreciated the fact that they were so willing to work with me at the time because, yeah. I mean, it was literally just my first song. I hadn't yeah. done anything before then. Yeah. Worked with the likes of Shoma Josi, Nomuzi, um, Nelly C, Sibia. Uh, also worked with recently Blackie Kamumpela on my new single as well. Yeah. Uh, Moonchild, Boiti as well. So yeah. there's just a couple, yeah. Wow. So from finance to DJing, producer. Yes. How has your background in finance influenced or shaped the, your approach to, to managing money in the entertainment industry? I think it's helped me a lot because I understand from a banking perspective uh. what the bank wants when I want to buy assets. Ah. And I don't think a lot of artists have that information. They don't yeah. understand the, the importance of how to present yourself as a business, how to, um, how to even have financial statements, which I don't think they, they took very seriously. Yeah. Even having something like insurance, um, I never used to take insurance seriously until I got insurance because I was forced to get it because I was working at the bank. Yeah. But you realize little things like that are, are a necessity, especially when you're kind of growing up and you're going to become an adult. And being an artist, I realized a lot of artists just, they get money hand to mouth, literally everything kind of works like this. Yeah. And I realized for myself that I needed to register a company, I needed to have financial statements, I needed to have uh, create my own asset base for myself oh. to also... Uh, run myself as a business and not necessarily say that I'm a freelancer yeah. because there's so many implications when it comes to that whether it comes to tax or it comes to um, just the general expenses being able to have a credit score being able to apply for certain things and I see a lot of artists now who are struggling with that and mm. maybe they depend on their management or they depend on a label to acquire assets for them but they don't realize how those things are actually bought for them and then it becomes a whole conversation of hey hey you stole my money eesh, that eesh. whole conversation happens hey, but, it's because, but it's because they don't have the education of how these things work yes. in the back and mm -hmm. if a label is going to buy a car for you they buy it because they've got the credit score they've yeah. got the financial backing yes. to actually get those assets for you. you can't just wake up and say i want the car uh, where do you get the car from yeah you know so i think it definitely helped from that perspective have you explored that opportunity maybe i mean given that the fact that it's such a huge gap in the entertainment mm. industry the behind the scene is, is is the area where they 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 lack I mean, yeah is, that, is, that, is it something you've explored maybe? i mean definitely i have thought about it um thought about how i would um actually help people and so forth but you know artists are headaches <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just don't, they, you can't tell them anything. So they just want to. Yeah. They just want to rock on the weekend, and then mm. they'll see what they do during the week. Mm. So it's not that I haven't thought about how to actually do it. The thing is with finance is that people don't want to talk about money. People don't want to talk about how they manage it. People don't want to expose themselves as to how little they actually have mm. in their bank account because it's coming in and going out at the same time. Mm. People don't want to expose themselves to conversations like that. They just want to see the high life. Yeah. Social media, Instagram. This is what I have. Yeah. So. I think for me right now, I'm just trying to figure out a way to have the conversation without making it seem very invasive, uh, without it being too draining and boring that it doesn't make sense to the next person. Yeah. It's interesting for me because I studied it, but yeah. for the next person, it's not. Winning the DJ of the Year, the 2021 uh, South African Hip Hop Awards, yeah. is certainly a notable achievement for you. But how, when you look at it, I mean, how does this translate into opportunities for you, you know, to advance your, your career and all that? I appreciate the accolade. I appreciate the fact that there's a little bit of recognition and it's coming from uh, an award ceremony that is also um, highly regarded in the space as well. I think anybody and everybody who gets awards, it really is just a pat on the back. It's a, hey, well done, we recognize you, we see you. But you need to figure out how you work with it from there. Um, just because you've gotten recognition doesn't necessarily mean you need to kind of sit back and then say, 
okay, I've made it now because I've got my award, I can sit down. Mm. It needs to be a motivator. It needs to be something that you kind of use to cultivate to make more money mm. or for you to kind of get yourself into different spaces and you work a little bit harder. Mm. Mm. So you've also signed with uh, uh, Warner Music Africa. Mm. I mean, is, is this a big move on your part? And uh, how do you see this partnership changing things in terms yeah. of your career? I actually really appreciate the new collaboration with Warner Music. Mm. And I also think it's important for people to understand because there's always this conversation around labels and how labels are taking advantage of artists and yeah. artists don't know what they're signing uh. and meh, meh, meh. I really think that you can always kind of benefit uh. with two heads as opposed to one. Yeah. And for the longest time, I think I was operating solo, yeah. trying to figure it out on my own. Cause now me, I was being egotistical. Ah, yeah. don't worry, me, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> hey, I can get. I know everybody in this industry. Hey, I can get into any door. Yeah. And you realize it's actually a lot harder trying yeah. to manage so many things at once by yourself. Yeah. My signing actually with uh, Warner Music yeah. is more of a conversation of we're working together. It's a partnership. We're trying to take my yeah. brand with Cosmo to the next level yeah. together. Yeah. It's not a thing of they own me or I don't know what they're doing or whatever yeah. the case is. And uh, of course, I mean, I had a lawyer look at my contract, so everybody uh -huh. is getting what they need to get. Yeah. And I think that's the important part about it is that are my interests going to be served? Are their interests going to be served? Yes. Everybody needs to pull their weight and everybody will be happy at the end of the day. So what are your financial goals in this new phase of, of mm -hmm. your career? Signing with a big label like Warner, mm -hmm. definitely my mm -hmm. sites are looking at more international stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I've been doing a lot of work in South Africa and I think um, now's the time for me to kind of elevate just a little bit more and mm -hmm. see where else I can kind of take myself. And partnering and working mm -hmm. with, uh, with Warner Music Group gives me the access to those to those types of opportunities. Yeah. So yeah. definitely hoping to see if I can do a lot more stuff in Europe, possibly the United States, Australia in the next couple of years, yeah. How is business right now? Hey, it's, it's <laughs> tricky for everybody. Sales yeah. economy is a little bit tricky yeah. for all of us. Yeah. You know what? I think everybody is really just still trying to recuperate what they lost from COVID. Oh, yeah. I think that's the biggest thing that we're not... Uh giving account to is that artists are the ones that suffered the most mm. during COVID. Mm. Everybody else, all of my friends who were working in the bank or had nine to fives were happily working from home mm. with their laptops, clicking away, money yeah. still coming in on the 25th. <laughs> we were the ones who were suffering because we couldn't jump on stages. We couldn't perform anywhere. We couldn't go to the club. We couldn't do anything. So from an asset or finance perspective, we lost a lot of money. So I think a lot of artists right now are still trying to we're basically working backwards, trying to fix what we lost in the yeah. last two years and now seeing how we can move forward from there. For myself particularly, I do think I am now in a more recovered phase of yeah. where I was, especially for where things had kind of gotten lost in the last two, three years. But um, yeah. I do think now it's just a case of moving forward. We can't really sit and cry over spilled milk. Yeah. What happened, happened. Now it's about moving forward and building from there. What are you doing differently this time around to make sure that if there was another pandemic, mm. uh, God forbid, uh, that you would handle the situation better? What are you doing differently? Definitely a lot more savings. Mm. Generally speaking, a financier or an insurance broker, whatever the case is, your financial planner would say to you, okay, have savings for plus minus about six months. Yeah. We had COVID for two years. <laughs> You're two reminding years. us, hey, oh. So it was like, yeah. okay, when we got to month number eight, I was like, when is this thing ending? What's yeah. going on? Yeah. So it makes you realize that things are not as put into stone as you think it is. Yeah. Or everybody's just projecting. Yeah. Projection is a case, yeah. in other words. We're basically looking at what we think might happen and we say, okay, maybe six mm. months, maybe eight months. Mm. So I think for me now, I'm trying to do things which are a lot more solidified. So mm. I'm trying to do things that I think will be able to help me in the long run, which is getting back into buying property or buying a car or buying, getting into business. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of artists also need to understand that we can't work on just gig money only. Because yeah. gig money also, is, it's here and there. Promoters are also suffering. Yeah. Promoters are also still trying to recover from what happened. Um, brands are also now re-looking at the way that they're spend, spending money. Mm. They used to pump a lot of money into their yeah. venues. Mm. Now they're not doing that anymore. They're going into social media. They're yeah. going into different types of marketing. Mm. So because all those things are changing, we also get affected because of their decisions. Yeah. So I think it's important for artists to also look at other streams of income. Yeah. And those other streams don't necessarily mean you have to go into a nine to five. 
survive. You can build yourself and build your brand, either getting into um, business like, you know, the likes of DJ Zintle or whatever, yeah. where she's got her, uh, her, her jewelry brand, or yeah. you can get into brand partnerships or you build an agency. Yeah. There's different ways to kind of skin this cat as long as you can figure out from a money perspective what else to do. Being a public figure, managing finances under spotlight would always be a challenge because mm. society expects you need to drive a particular type of car, you need to mm. go to certain type of places, and you need to live in a particular area and so on. How do you navigate that kind of pressure? Very quickly, I told myself that these things aren't as necessary as we think they are. Mm. Number one, nobody knows where you live. <laughs> Number two, <laughs> nobody has to know what car you're driving. <laughs> Number three, you don't have to shop in the Diamond Walk. It's not a necessity. Yeah. You start to sit back and you look at where am I spending a lot of my money? Uh, Does it make sense for me to spend all that money? Uh, and for me, I quickly remembered, okay, cool. I might drive a certain car, but maybe I don't want other people to know I drive this car. So I'll purposely not post it or I won't put it in, in uh, on social media. Know, or but others will post them. And that's the problem. <laughs> Because I just feel like as long as you can get to your gigs and you can get home, that's all that yeah. matters. I think it's important to understand that those things are your private you know, places and you can uh, spend however is in your budget for you to stay where you need to. Clothes, fashion, like we don't really have to buy all of these expensive brands. Anybody can shop wherever they can just to look good because it's about looking good. It's not yeah. about feeling expensive. Yes. So I think for me, because my brain works like that, I'm always just like, it doesn't make sense for me to spend 30,000 Rand on a handbag. Yeah. I sit there and I'm just like, I could have done this, this, this and this with that 30,000. Yeah. So um, I try to manage myself like that. To say, okay, rather let me go shopping maybe with three, 4,000 Rand. Mm. I can still get clothes. I can still yeah. look good. Yeah. And then use that rest of the money doing other things that make more sense to me, you know? Yeah. Looking at the evolution of your career, I mean, earlier on you spoke about diversifying income. Mm. What is your approach? Finding myself in different spaces. How I've kind of done it for myself is I've looked at where my strengths are. Yes, I started as a DJ, mm. but then I diversified and I went into radio. I went into some TV spaces. I'm now doing podcasting. I'm also then in the music space as well. Mm. All of those things are kind of working for me. Now I'm able to exp expand my brand and also then get into campaigns, pitching certain ideas to brands as well to get that money back. Mm. And that's exactly why I said, artists don't have to get into a nine to five to make more money. Mm. You are who you are because people appreciate the artist that you yeah, are today. Right. Mm. How else can you use it? Yes. So if you're a singer, maybe you're doing I don't know, you're doing background singing for a movie or whatever yeah. the case may be, yeah. or you find yourself doing voiceover yeah. work, or maybe you are going into theater. All those things can pay you. Yeah. You just have to get yourself into those spaces. Yeah. You know? mm. So how does this work then? So you're doing uh, different gigs. I mean, does all the money come straight into your bank account? I mean, or do you have a company, the money goes in there, and mm. then you draw a salary there, and how does it work? How do you do that? Part and parcel of me understanding my finances, because of my finance background, I do have a business um, account. And from there is when I kind of draw my salary from there and take mm. whatever I need to take from, from the business. And then the rest has to kind of grow the business. Yeah. yeah. So how do you deal with uh, Mr. Textman? Like everybody else, I have an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some people might not have accountants, like yes. you said. I mean, we hear stories and, I mean... Uh, Look, you know. there's a lot of stories. Mm. And you must also remember, with every story, there's two sides to yeah. it. Yeah. So, the receiver might see it that you're running away from tax, but maybe your accountant just did the wrong thing. Okay. And it's not to say that I don't want to deal with my taxes. As artists, we don't understand it. Mm. Like a friend of mine the other day was even complaining on Instagram. She was just like, I have to register a company. Now I have to register for VAT. What does VAT even yeah. mean? And yeah. I called her and I was like, don't worry, I'll explain what VAT is to you. Yeah. I'll explain how it works. Mm. Because generally speaking, creatives just don't understand these yeah. necessities. So, and that's why I think an accountant is very important, but yeah. you need to have somebody that you trust. Yes. Because there's some shady ones Eish. who are also stealing money. <laughs> and then you see people on newspapers yeah. and you ask yourself how, yeah. because they have so much money. Mm. But that artist doesn't know what the accountant is doing. So it's very difficult. So mm. I think a trusting also needs to kind, kind yeah. of come into play in that perspective. Okay. Yeah. So as a woman in entertainment, have you faced any unique challenges? Um, and if so, what are those kind of challenges and how do you deal with them? I think the challenges that most women um, face in the entertainment space is just the difference in treatment. Mm. Obviously, because I'm a woman in South Africa, off the bat, I'm mm. already getting paid less than a guy. Yeah. 
that's the first challenge that we all experience. But how? We are both artists. That's my problem. Yes. We're all doing the same job. Why yes. am I getting paid less? That's just... So I've had to fight for my, my right to then say, this person's earning this amount of money, but this is what I'm bringing. This is how I can uh, elevate myself. And I think it's important for women to say, okay, cool, you want to earn the same as a guy? How much, what are you bringing to the table? Are you working hard to upskill yourself to actually bring right. yourself a little bit further? Also for women, we have more expenses. Yeah. We have makeup, we have hair, we have outfits, we have, we need a, we need a road manager. We can't go to gigs by ourselves. That's true. I have to pay either a driver mm. or a road manager to be with me mm. just from a safety perspective. Yeah. I need to make sure I look good so when I arrive somewhere, my makeup is expensive, mm. hair is expensive, outfits are expensive. Mm. Everything kind of plays a part. Whereas my male counterparts just arrive in their ah, tracksuit pants, tracksuit <laughs> pants and their 10 <laughs> rand haircuts. <laughs> And they're good to go. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's very difficult from that perspective. So we have to work a little bit harder because we have way more expenses yeah. than the guys do. Yeah. Yeah. Finally, um, what would your advice be to people who want to get into the industry um, and they have no clue on how they need to navigate their finances? I think for me, I'd always have to say, get yourself a financial planner. I think that's the important thing. Yeah. And the reason why I say that is because their job is to help you manage to save a little bit of money, but also put your money in the right places, but also how to manage yourself as a business. Mm. Savings are also very important. And I know people are very difficult, well, they find it very difficult to save money. Mm. So I've always said to them, okay, maybe you don't have to do it for yourself where you're taking 100 rand and putting it away. Get a debit order, because yeah. then it's forced. You don't have a choice. The money's going, it yeah. disappears for however long. Yeah. And then when you want to access it, you can access it when you want. Yeah. I find it easier that way, because it's very hard to say, hey, but maybe yeah. I can buy a six pack on the weekend with yeah. this 100 rand. Yeah. But if it's a debit order, it's gone, it's done, it's out of your mind. Yeah. But I definitely think the first point would be get a financial planner, because they can work with whatever amount of money you're working with. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, 100,000 rand. It could even just be 10,000, and they'll help you, and they'll know how, what to do with it. Yeah. Mm. Well, Ms. Cosmo, thank you for joining us. Thank you mm. for your insights thank and your you. wisdom. And I'm sure a lot of us uh, would learn from what you've shared with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I sure, appreciate sure. it. Sure, sure. <laughs>